The Lost Promise of Civil Rights was published by Harvard University Press, and the author is Professor Risa Galyubov of the University of Virginia. Professor Galyubov, what is the Civil Rights Section? The Civil Rights Section is a unit of the federal government, of the United States government, that was created in 1939, so just before World War II. And when it was created, it was part of the Department of Justice, and when it was created, it was thought to be its, its charge was to protect individual rights, fundamental individual rights. But people weren't exactly sure what that meant. And what they first thought it meant was labor rights, the rights of workers trying to collectively bargain and organize into unions. But when World War II started, uh, race became much more prominent on the national political scene. And the civil rights section started to think about how to protect the rights of African Americans. Um, and as a result, they started to think about how to protect the rights of African American workers. And so the civil rights section during World War II and in the 1940s takes a whole bunch of cases in which the rights of black workers are at stake and prosecutes all kinds of uh, employers for violations of civil rights laws. So was it formed by executive order? Was it formed by legislation? It was formed by executive order. Uh, it was formed by President Franklin Roosevelt uh, and at, at the request of uh, Frank Murphy, who is the Attorney General, and uh, and Frank Murphy was a big labor guy. He was from Michigan. Uh, he he uh, he was a very big supporter of labor unions, and he was also uh, he goes on to a career after he's Attorney General of uh, as a Supreme Court Justice, and so he's a big proponent of individual rights as well. What kind of press did it get when it was first formed? Was it was there controversy about it? There wasn't that much controversy about it. Uh, it, it. It didn't get that much press. It was very small, about seven people. And in fact, a lot of what it does over the course of World War II, I think it can do because it's small and largely, largely flies below the radar screen. Does it still exist? Uh, it, it became the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice in 1957. Uh, so it doubles in size in 1957 and becomes its own division and gradually gets much bigger, especially after the 1964 uh, Civil Rights Act and the 1965 Voting Rights Act. Uh, it, its enforcement powers and its capacity and the number of lawyers and its status grows. So in a way, yes, it does still exist. How does the Civil Rights Section tie into the title of your book, The Lost Promise? Of civil rights? Uh, it's crucial to the title of my book. The book is about civil rights before Brown versus Board of Education. And 1954? 1954, yep. And so it's basically about civil rights between the New Deal in the 1930s and Brown versus Board of Education in 1954. And the idea is to try to think about what civil rights looked like before Brown. Brown tells us one vision of civil rights, that Jim Crow was a system of state-mandated segregation. And in Brown versus Board of Education, the Supreme Court tells us that's not constitutional. And we move from there into a new era of civil rights. And this book asks, what did civil rights look like before Brown, before we had that idea of Jim Crow? And it does so by looking at what black workers were asking lawyers to do for them, what they thought Jim Crow did to them and how it harmed them, and their understanding of what Jim Crow was was a lot broader than the image that comes out of Brown versus Board of Education. Their image was it's not only laws saying that black children and white children go to different schools. It's not only signs over water fountains. It's not only anti-miscegenation laws. It's also employers who only hire whites, industries that only hire whites, or hire African Americans only for the worst paid and most dangerous uh, and worst conditioned jobs. It's uh, the federal government and the state governments interfering in the economy in racially discriminatory ways. So the image that comes out of the cases that the civil rights section takes on behalf of African American workers reveal a Jim Crow that is much more total, much more economic, much more about deprivation and exploitation, as well as about stigma and symbolism and state-mandated law. During that period, Risa Galibov, what were some of the successes of the civil rights section? So the big successes of the civil rights section were uh, had to do with agricultural workers in the South 
actually, uh, who were really a lot of the worst off of African Americans and of Americans of any race or color. Um, and a lot of the complaints that came to the civil rights section were from agricultural workers in the South who were essentially held in slavery in forms of involuntary servitude. Uh, and they asked the civil rights section for help, and the civil rights section actually prosecuted individual employers for holding their employees in involuntary servitude. And they went on from those agricultural cases to cases of domestic workers, which usually involved African American women. Um, and, and those workers uh, complained that not just that they were being held against their will, because often they were allowed to go to the store by themselves or leave the, the, their employer's presence by themselves, but they were so subjugated to them. They were kept in attics or in chicken coops. They were fed very little. They were paid almost nothing for their labor. They were never given days off. And there are cases that the civil rights section prosecuted in which they say, even though they weren't held in chains, even though they weren't being held by coercion, uh, this was a form of slavery, and, and people can't treat other people this way. Where, when did the term civil rights become uh, into our lexicon, and, and prior to the era that you were talking about, when did civil rights legislation or action start to develop? So it's, it's an interesting question, and the term civil rights has a really long history, and in American history, it means different things over different periods of time. And one of the things that I discovered as I wrote this book was that during uh, the early 20th century, civil rights largely referred to property rights and contract rights of individuals who wanted to be free to contract with employers or employees or property owners without interference from the government. Uh, and in the mid-1930s, with New Deal regulation of the economy, those kinds of rights are problematic, right? If you're going to have large-scale interventions to the economy, every individual can't have a right to contract to take on dangerous work with no protections, right? We have agencies now that say you can't do that. Um, and so in the 1930s, civil rights comes to refer to collective labor rights, uh, rights to collectively bargain and join a union and the kinds of rights that uh, the National Labor Relations Act and the Fair Labor, um, uh, uh, Fair Labor Acts all kind of uh, protected. Um, and then something really interesting happens, which is in the 1940s and the 1950s, civil rights becomes much more entwined with race. Uh, but that's not always been the case, and that really changes. And one of the other really interesting things is that it's not always clear that civil rights mean voting rights, or that civil rights mean the right to eat in a restaurant on a non-segregated basis. If you look back at uh, the Civil War um, era and the Reconstruction era when the 14th Amendment, which is one of the main amendments that supports civil rights today, uh, was ratified, people really thought that civil rights were about owning property and making contracts and sitting on juries uh, and being able to sue in court, but not about what they called social rights being able to go to a hotel or ride on a streetcar or go to a restaurant um, or attend a school, and certainly not political rights, which were voting rights. So the, the definition that we have of civil rights coming out of the civil rights movement in the 1960s is very different from multiple changes in definitions that you see over the course of American history. Where did you grow up? When did you get interested in this topic? So I grew up in Brooklyn. Uh, and when I grew up, my image of what it was to be an American based on my own family where, uh, where we had a very robust sense of our family history was you come from Eastern Europe and you go through Ellis Island and you go to the Lower East Side and then eventually you live in Brooklyn. And, uh, and I got to college and I, um, I, I came across uh, James Goodman uh, and a book he wrote called Stories of Scottsboro. And I ended up taking a class with him on the American South in the 1920s and 1930s. And had you ever visited the South? I had not. I mean, you know, we had gone to Monticello as a child and, and New Orleans, and, but I had really never thought about a completely different kind of America with completely different race relations and ethnic relations and histories. And, you know, everyone I knew, it was a few generations in America, you know, and here's generation after generation and very different racial politics. And um, I, I then spent, you know, several summers in college in the South. Uh, I, I spent time after I graduated from college in the South, and I just thought that it was really um, a world very unlike what I had experienced, although one of the things that I discovered in writing this book was that we think of Jim Crow as a Southern experience. 
And I don't think that's true anymore. I, I think there was, uh, there, there was a lot about Jim Crow, if you understand it more broadly, that was true of the whole nation. Uh, certainly certain forms of the state mandated aspects of segregation were largely limited to the South, although not entirely at all, um, but that, uh, uh, that a lot of the more private economic forms of exploitation existed nationally. And part of why I think we haven't gone as far in getting to civil rights uh, as I would like to see us do is because we defined the problem as a southern problem.